Why do congregations of the Lord's Church exist? What is God's purpose for them? We'll talk about that next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Evangelist Kevin Presley. Nearly any entity that survives and succeeds has a mission. If you start a business, that business needs some kind of mission statement to give it purpose and direction. It reminds its employees of why that business exists and makes it more likely the company will stay on target and be successful. We run into problems in any business or organization, and even in our individual lives, if we lose sight of our purpose and mission. So why did Jesus build His church? That is to say, why did He bring Christians together into a living, cohesive, working, active body? What is the mission of the church? It seems we've forgotten that to a large degree, at least in America in the 21st century. We've been studying in recent weeks about the church that Jesus built. We've seen what it is and what it is not, when it was built, how it was built, and why it's essential to be a vital and active part of it. But why is it here? I want us to look at several verses in Ephesians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul has shown, actually beginning in the second chapter, how Christ Jesus built His church, including Jews and Gentiles within it, and revealed its plan and its purpose. And he writes here in the third chapter, beginning in the eighth verse, "...unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord." Well, the church is the result of God's foreknowledge and planning. And Paul says that the church's very existence declares the wisdom of God unto all. We should never forget the mission of the church of Christ, and we dare not divert its focus away from that which Christ intended for it to accomplish in this world. So we'll talk about the mission of the church in a moment. If you've ever visited an assembly of the Church of Christ, you've seen that it's different. No rock bands, no choirs and praise teams, no theatrical productions. That's because we believe worship is simple but profound and is according to what's revealed in God's Word. When you visit with the Church of Christ, you'll find that everybody simply sings the praise of the Lord together, congregationally. We meet around the Lord's table every Sunday to remember the body and blood of the Lord and His new covenant. We pray together, and none of that pop psychology, but sound teaching from the Word of God. Oh, and one more thing. We won't ask for your money. Members provide for the needs of the local church through a weekly collection. So forget all the hype. Come see the difference and be our honored guest today. Follow Let the Bible Speak on Twitter at LTBS TV.
A successful business or organization usually formulates a statement of its mission and then its investment and effort goes toward fulfilling that mission. Some great companies have been built around a particular philosophy or mission. Uh, for example, the online sales giant Amazon.com has as its mission statement, quote, it is our goal to be Earth's most customer-centric company where customers can find and discover anything they might want to buy online. eBay says that, quote, they want to provide a global trading platform where practically anyone can trade practically anything. And then Google says that its mission is to, quote, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Well, it's pretty obvious that all of those companies have succeeded in their mission. Not only do they do on a daily basis what they say they set out to do, but any of us who are familiar with them or use their platforms would immediately associate those characteristics with their name or brand. That's a successful mission statement, and that statement has, in effect, made them successful. Well, we want the church to succeed, but succeed at what? Why is it here? Thankfully, you and I don't need to come up with a mission statement for the church. The Lord and His apostles already took care of that. It doesn't take a collaborative team, an agency, or a, a boardroom filled with bright executives to craft a mission statement for the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom was given its marching orders, its business plan, if you please, its mission statement 2,000 years ago by the head of the church himself as he prepared to enter heaven and take up his place as head of the church and king of his kingdom. The problem is we forget what that mission is sometimes. Jesus told his disciples just before he ascended back to glory, in Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18, All power or authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now that great commission given to His disciples, which, by the way, they fulfilled in their own day, according to Colossians 1 and verse 23, but that great commission given to them encapsulates the purpose of the church even today. Jesus' own mission to earth was so succinctly, uh, succinctly stated to Zacchaeus in Luke 19 and verse 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why Jesus left the portals of heaven and came to earth. His birth, His life, His deeds, His miracles, His words, His death, His resurrection, were all to accomplish His stated mission of seeking out and saving those who were lost and condemned. He didn't come to be a political revolutionary, although some mistakenly thought so. He didn't come to found a charity or to make the world a brighter place to go to hell from. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And He told His disciples that He would build His church upon returning to heaven and that their mission would be to take the testimony of His death, burial, and resurrection to the lost world. Paul later said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, that he and the other apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ had, quote, preached not themselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the gospel was entrusted into the hands of men, the earthen vessels known as the apostles, to illuminate the world that was steeped in the darkness and the blindness and the ignorance of sin. Now just to put it in a nutshell, that's what the church and its mission in this world is all about. But I want to consider with you for a few minutes what the church is not. And I hate to begin on a negative note, but there's so much, mis much misunderstanding today about why the church exists in the world. People have all sorts of expectations of the church. Uh, maybe when they began seeking a local church to assemble with, they have a number of expectations about what that church should be, what that church should be busy doing, 
But let me show you what the church is not. First of all, the church is not a political entity or a political power. In fact, Jesus drew a clear line of distinction between the two in Matthew 22 and verse 21 when He said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Now, yes, everything is under God's domain, but there are two separate realms of activity. God has ordained civil state to keep civil order in the world, but His kingdom of Jesus Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, has a spiritual mission that has nothing whatsoever to do with politics and the affairs of the civil state. In fact, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul really described the Christian's relationship to the government, wherever the church might be found, whatever government it may live under. Paul said, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever, he says, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Here the Apostle Paul simply says, God uses civil authority for a civil purpose in the world. And that Christians are to submit unto that authority, to submit unto that power. The exception being, according to the fifth chapter of the book of Acts, when man, that is, when the government's decree would cause us to violate the decree of God, in which case the apostle said, we must obey God rather than man. But the Bible tells us, short of that, that we're to live quiet and peaceable lives. We're to render tribute unto Caesar, unto the government, that we are to be submissive citizens. And you don't read in the Bible or in early church history where the disciples of Jesus Christ went about trying to subvert the Roman government or mount some sort of an insurrection or a revolt against the rule of the Romans. They went about the world preaching the truth and exalting the crucified Christ. And they did so at great expense, even the expense of their own welfare, their own lives. They didn't try to operate by changing the government. They tried to operate by changing the hearts of men by the preaching of the truth. The church is not a political institution. Sometimes you hear men who purport to be religious leaders, national religious leaders, world religious leaders, and you'll see them on television news programs being interviewed about some subject or another. And um, they're known as preachers, representatives of some religious organization or religious faith. Strangely enough, you listen to them. You never hear the name of Jesus Christ come from their lips. You never hear them tell the world, the audience that they have before them, what to do in order to be saved from their sins. They're issuing their opinion on this political subject or that political issue, this social issue, that social controversy. But friends, that's not what the church is all about. It is not a political institution. Second of all, the church is not a social reform institution. Now, make no mistake, Christianity will reform a society, but it does so through changing men's hearts by the gospel. When you convert men to Jesus Christ and His way of life, and they begin to live by the law of the kingdom, and uh, they begin to rule their lives according to the rule of King Jesus, well then obviously and naturally you'll see a change in the environment in which we live. But Christianity was not founded to try to force social change through the governments and powers of earth. The church will never and is not expected to eradicate, for example, poverty in the world. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 14 and verse 7, For ye have the poor with you always. That doesn't mean that we as Christians are not to help the poor. We are to help the poor. We who are individual Christians as we go through life day by day are to take pity and have compassion upon those who are less fortunate and do as we can and as we have ability and opportunity to help them. But you see, the church's mission is not to go out and eradicate poverty and disease and suffering from the world. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 7, Jesus said, The poor you will always have. You'll never eradicate poverty off the face of the earth. In Acts chapter 3, you recall a lame man sat outside the temple at the beautiful gate begging alms. And recall where Peter stopped and Peter and John looked at him and the man thought that Peter and John were about to give him money, but Peter said in Acts 3 and verse 6, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You see, he met the man's greater need 
And the reason for that was the gospel was then preached in that place and 5,000 people obeyed the gospel and were saved from their sins. The church is not commissioned to make people happy on the highway to hell, but to get them off of that highway of life spiritually, to preach Jesus to them and get them in an eternally saved condition. Thirdly, the church is not a recreational outlet. Fun, games, fitness, whatever else have become the rage of religion in our time. Uh, many churches not only preach a social gospel, they preach a sensual gospel as well. That is appealing to the petty and uh, fleshly and carnal appetites of people in order to bring people in and pack their pews. Uh, they treat the church like some sort of a business entity that has a bottom line and a number quota and therefore they employ all kinds of gimmicks and so forth to bring in the crowds, to excite and entice the young people. Friend, there's a time and a place for Christians to eat together and enjoy each other's company, to be together on a social level, and I'm all for that in the right time and the right place. But the priority of the church is not recreational enjoyment. It is nearly impossible for me to imagine churches of the first century organizing ball teams and chariot races and building fitness clubs and putting on concerts and building banquet halls and employing theatrical devices to get people to come in and listen to the gospel. Can you honestly, as you read the book of Acts, can you imagine that? Now they associated with each other, make no doubt. They associated with one another from house to house. They showed hospitality to each other and to others. But their mission and their work was serious business. It wasn't fun and games. They didn't compete with one another and try to come up with one gimmick after another to draw people to their assemblies. Rather, they went everywhere preaching the Word, we read in Acts the 8th chapter. Romans 14 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul said, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times people get all wrapped up in temporal things and temporal considerations, and they forget the big picture. And that is what the kingdom of God and the church of Jesus Christ is all about. You see, that's really what the mission of the church is, though, is to make known the spiritual verities of life and eternity. Paul said to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of God life. He wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, If I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth, he says. The church's mission is to declare the truth to the world, to save those who don't believe by preaching the gospel to them so they can hear it, believe it, and obey it. And friend, isn't it really time for the church to simply be the church? There's something refreshing about that to me. It's time for the church to simply be the church and stop trying to be everything else that God never intended or appointed for it to be. Can you imagine what we could accomplish if we spent as much money, dedicated as much of our time and energy to preaching the truth to a lost and dying world as we do to building large and lavish and gaudy, impressive buildings, family life centers, gymnasiums, theaters, and on and on the list goes. Just a simple place to come together and worship and go forth from that place every week to tell others about Jesus Christ and His truth. Friend, that's what it's all about. Not all of this other stuff that has come to characterize church and Christianity over the past 50 years. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That's what it's about, friend. The church's number one mission is to preach the gospel. Notice what else Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20. Go ye therefore and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You see, it's also the responsibility of the local church not only to save the lost, but then to train the saved. How do we strengthen disciples? How do we edify the church? Jesus said by teaching them. Teaching them what? To observe all things He has commanded. And the bottom line is any church that is pleasing to God and fulfilling its God-given mission 
is a church that is started by the Word, preaches the Word, is grounded in the Word, and lives the Word. It's all about upholding the Word of God to a lost world and serving as the pillar and the ground of the truth. The church's mission is also to mutually care for itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 24 through 27, Paul likened the church unto a body with many parts, and he says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one of another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members are uh, in particular. You see, the church is a body of believers united by mutual faith in Christ Jesus, and it is to live and function as a body, to care for, encourage, and support each other as we make our way through this world to our eternal home. And that goes back to what we talked about last time. That's one of the major reasons why you, my friend, need to be a faithful, accountable, and active part of the local church if you're a baptized believer in Christ Jesus. And then, fourthly, the local church exists to glorify God. In all of these things that we've talked about, Paul said, Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21. The local church does not exist to make a name for itself in the community, to acquire or yield political or any other kind of power. The work assigned to it by King Jesus is not such that the church can then point to itself and boast of all that it does in the world and its power and its influence in society. No, its mission, its purpose, and its design is solely to bring glory to God by upholding His truth, bringing souls to Him, and preparing people to spend eternity with Him in heaven. That's the mission of the church. And last of all, I want to mention the all-sufficiency of the local church. You see, the local church is God's means and medium of accomplishing the work assigned to His people. The early church knew nothing of parachurch organizations, missionary societies, denominational uh, organizations and hierarchy. They certainly knew nothing of the gimmicks and worldly amusements that many have employed to advance the cause. Rather, read the book of Acts. They went forth into the streets into the synagogues, into homes, into the public square. They simply declared Jesus Christ and Him crucified and arisen. And people were converted to Him by the thousands at a time simply because they were faithful to preach and to live the Word. And could it be that we see a decline in Christianity and our culture because we've lost sight of the simple mission of the church? Have we lost our zeal and our commitment to that simple mission? Each Christian working under the auspices or oversight of his or her local church and being a soul winner for Jesus every day. Is the gospel message continually burning in our hearts and pouring from our lips and exuding from our lives? Friends, that's what the church is planted in your community for. And I hope that you are a faithful, active part of the body of Jesus Christ in your community. Wonderful grace of Jesus.
The psalmist said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word, and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course. It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Want to see today's study again? Watch Let the Bible Speak anytime, even on the go, on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Go to letthebiblespeak.tv and also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Our study today has been on the mission of the church. I hope that you'll investigate the churches of Christ because we are truly dedicated to the mission of proclaiming the gospel to the world, of pointing men to Jesus Christ and how to be saved through obedient faith in Him. You're not going to find thrills and frills and gimmicks, but people who simply want to follow the teachings of the New Testament and hold forth, as Paul told the church at Philippi, hold forth the word of life. If you'd like a free transcript of today's lesson, get in touch with us. We'll give you our contact information in just a moment, and we'll be happy to send it to you. I want to continue and hopefully conclude our series next week with a lesson on the destiny of the church. Sure glad you've been with us for Let the Bible Speak today. Spread the word about our program, won't you? And be sure to join us back here next time, the Lord willing, for another study of the Word of God. Until then, have a great week, and may the Lord bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.